Many people still don't think same-sex marriage will affect them. I even put this concern to the chairman at the time of the school committee. A little girl saying, I love my girlfriend, I must be gay. And he said, David, I have no problem with that whatsoever. In our new documentary, The Problem with Same-Sex Marriage, we sent our crews out to document the impact of same-sex marriage. You'll be surprised by what we found. The little black book, Queer in the 21st Century, it tells kids how to perform homosexual sex acts. Here we have government officials directly attacking a major world religion for its doctrinal teaching. The president is being hypocritical in his stances. He is defending his federal health care law in court, and yet DOMA has been upheld four times in federal court, and yet he's decided it doesn't deserve to be uh, defended. The words carved in stone above the entrance to the United States Supreme Court say equal justice under law. But since the court issued its Roe v. Wade ruling in 1973, justice for 50 million Americans is forever lost. Hello, my name is Tony Perkins. The United States Supreme Court is across the street from the U.S. Capitol here in Washington, D.C. Laws passed on that side of the street can be changed every two years when citizens vote in a new Congress. But Decisions made on this side of the street and the United States Supreme Court are far more permanent. Roe v. Wade is but one example. We're still living with the incredible cost of that infamous Supreme Court decision. But I'm not here today to plead with you for the lives of the unborn, even though that would be a very worthy cause. I'm here today to show you the impact of same-sex marriage on your sons and daughters. Same-sex marriage is currently recognized in five states. Meanwhile, 30 states have enacted constitutional amendments that define marriage as a union of one man and one woman. But that could all change based upon what the Supreme Court decides. I think it's very likely that the Defense of Marriage Act is going to end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Federal DOMA, or the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, was enacted in 1996 by an overwhelming margin in Congress. Signed into law by President Clinton, has now been the law of the land for 15 plus years. This law defines marriage for all purposes under federal law, which we know there are 1,100 plus places in federal law where marriage intersects with federal law defines marriage as the union of one man and one woman. But this is being challenged by advocates who want same-sex marriage. DOMA not only had a setback in a recent court case, it also lost its primary defender. The Attorney General wrote a letter to members of Congress stating that they were, they meaning the Department of Justice, was no longer going to defend the Defense of Marriage Act in court. And they based this on their view that it was unconstitutional. It's not up to the President of the United States to determine if something is constitutional or not. That's what we have the courts for. And so he ought to defend the law and let the courts decide on any constitutionality. The basis that they're using to attack this statute is that there is some sort of, quote, right in the Constitution to homosexual marriage. Well, if that right exists, then that's in the federal Constitution it now completely trumps every state law, every state constitution, and essentially what they will have done is forced same-sex marriage on the entire country without anybody even having the right to vote on it. I was offended because it is the job of the president. The president of the United States takes an oath of office to uphold the laws of the nation. and. It is the rule of law that separates us from some of the regimes across the world where you have so much lawlessness. The president is being hypocritical in his stances, where on the one hand, he is defending his federal health care law in court, even though there have been two federal judges that have ruled it unconstitutional. And yet DOMA has been upheld four times in federal court, 
and yet he's decided it doesn't deserve to be uh, defended and has instructed his Justice Department to not defend it anymore. It doesn't make any sense at all. The Defense of Marriage Act, known also as DOMA, defines marriage for federal purposes as the union of one man and one woman. The law also prevents one state from imposing same-sex marriage on another state. The law is currently being challenged in at least 10 pending cases across the nation. One will most likely find its way to the Supreme Court very soon. The outcome of that case could change the definition of marriage nationwide forever. In 2003, when the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts mandated same-sex marriage, there was no way to know the full impact of that decision. But today, more than eight years later, there is clear evidence showing the problems associated with same-sex marriage. We in Massachusetts have had same-sex marriage forced upon us for seven years now. And the first level of impact is in our schools. From kindergarten through 12th grade and beyond, our children are being indoctrinated on same-sex marriage and the rightness, the correctness of homosexuality. The beginning of 2005, our son Jacob was going into kindergarten and he came home with a diversity book bag. And in the diversity book bag was a book entitled Who's in a Family by Robert Scutch. And that introduces children to same-sex households. Back in March of this year, our son came home Friday afternoon and bounded in the front door and said, Mom, Dad, guess what? Our teacher read us the funniest book. It was so silly. It was about a prince who was getting married, but he didn't marry a princess. He married a prince. That afternoon, we sent the teacher an email message. The teacher called back and said that, yes, it was a book about two princes who got married. King and King. It's a story that introduces the idea of men having a romantic relationship and getting married. Mm. We were shocked. And, and your son is how old? He's seven years old in second grade. And they read this book to him? Yes, in the formal classroom setting with this teacher as an authority figure presenting this concept as something that is good and right and the way things should be. After the diversity book bag came home, we realized that the intention of the administrators and teachers was to affirm these relationships and gay marriage in the minds of children. When we went into the school, what we requested is parental notification when these issues are brought up by adults within the school and the option to opt our child out of this type of indoctrination. And then uh, she said, well, she, she had checked with the administrators and had and they had said that this was not a print notification issue. One of the reasons they give is they said same-sex marriage is legal in Massachusetts. Therefore, we can broach it any time with your child. So when she would not um, acknowledge our parental rights in this area, we then went to our Judeo-Christian beliefs and our, our faith and said, well, you wish to affirm homosexuality um, to our son, you're presenting that which is sin as though it is not to our son, and we cannot allow that. To make a, a long story short, the accommodation they gave was to put me in handcuffs and send me to jail. And they were willing to handcuff a father and send him to jail. Um, it was a six by eight cell, uh, filthy. Um, but, you know, I felt I didn't have a choice at that point in order to fulfill my role and duty as a father. So we filed a lawsuit. Uh, long story short, the district court said that they didn't think we have a parental right to be notified in this. The federal court judge Mark Wolf uh, ruled to dismiss our case. Every citizen should take the time to go read his judgment uh, he spoke about this book, Changing Minds, in which, uh, to paraphrase, it, he believes that it's the school's job to change the minds of the young children, that they are indeed young and impressionable. So, so it's translating directly into what the courts did on gay marriage, and then teaching the children it's okay. And in fact, you could be gay too. I even put this concern to the chairman at the time of the school committee. A little girl saying, I love my girlfriend, I must be gay. 
And he said, David, I have no problem with that whatsoever about children being told this and thinking they're gay at a very early age. One mother t shared with me how she and her son were out doing yard work and a neighborhood child came up and asked uh, at the age of six or seven years of old uh, if it was all right uh, for this little boy to marry her son when he grew up. And the mother was aghast and said, well, well, no, of course not, that wouldn't be right. And the little boy said, oh yes, in Massachusetts, I can marry a man when I grow up. Children and teenagers are at a time in life where they're still figuring out who they are and what, what they like and their, their identity is still evolving. And so when they begin to label themselves as homosexual, gay or lesbian, bisexual, when they, they adopt those labels at a time in life when they're still evolving, that can have the effect of closing out other options for themselves. My name is Brian Kamaker. I'm president of Mass Resistance pro-family group in Massachusetts. Uh, here's an example of something that was, uh, that, that, that was at Brookline High. The Little Black Book, Queer in the 21st Century. Uh, this was picked up uh, at Brookline High School at a, a, a gathering of teachers and kids uh, pushing the, the, the gay agenda at that school. This is so disgusting that I can't really read it to you. It tells kids how to safely uh, perform a variety of homosexual sex acts. It, it tells where you can meet other kids who are homosexual or homosexual men. It was published by um, the AIDS Action Committee with money, as it says, from the Boston Department of Health, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, uh, and, the, um, and, and other groups that get public money. The Holy Grail is same-sex marriage is legal, therefore you can't stop us from talking about it. We're looking at the problems with same-sex marriage, how it becomes a legal platform for exposing our children to homosexual material. We've seen the problems with introducing elementary school kids to same-sex marriage and how same-sex marriage inevitably undermines parental rights. Now let's look at another problem the incredible impact on at-risk children who are placed in same-sex households. Sometimes homosexual activists will uh, argue that children raised by homosexual parents are no different from children raised by heterosexual parents. Unfortunately, the evidence simply does not support that. And there was a study conducted recently uh, which looked at the family histories of 262 children raised by uh, homosexual fathers or lesbian mothers. And it found that the percentages of children who, of homosexual parents, who themselves became something other than heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, or unsure of their sexual orientation, ranged from 16% of those children to as high as 57% of those children. Uh, daughters of lesbian mothers had the highest rates anywhere from 33 to 57 percent. Just to understand, the percentage of the total American population that identify themselves as either homosexual or bisexual was 3.5 percent, according to a very recent study. If you want to talk about the ratio, it's anywhere from somewhere from 5 to 15 times as likely to be homosexual or bisexual as the general population. Children raised by homosexual parents turn out very differently from children raised by heterosexual parents. We've looked at several ways same-sex marriage harms our children. Now let's look at another type of problem with it. Believe it or not, all Americans already have equal rights guaranteed by our Constitution. And it's no accident that our founders in the First Amendment put religious freedom first, before free speech, before freedom of the press, and even before our right to assemble to present our grievances. When we look at the impact of same-sex marriage on free speech, this is a cognate of religious liberty. 
The first liberty in the First Amendment is religious liberty. Unless we're free to believe what we believe, we cannot speak it, that's the freedom of speech. We cannot publish it, that's the freedom of the press. We cannot assemble on its basis, the freedom of assembly. And we cannot challenge the government, that's the freedom of the redress of grievances. So religious liberty is, is the big one. If you don't have that, you have no other liberties. And so it ultimately is a theological issue between a sexuality given by the God of Genesis 1 and 2, the one true creator, or any other idea outside the Bible. Uh, Sudden Love and Order, I wrote Setting Love and Order about 15 years ago it was published. And the reason I wrote it was to, one, tell my story of coming out of homosexuality after seeking for Christ. So I use my story in the book um, as a thread to show that homosexuality can be changed. And after writing the book, I got married and had five children. As the movement to um, uh, protect the rights of men and women who self-identify as gays and lesbians grew, um, hate speech laws came into existence. And the overbroad application of these hate speech laws and regulations uh, caused some books, such as mine, to go out of print. And the reason that occurred is that there was a, um, a covert discrimination against a Christian understanding of homosexuality. So for example, in the French-speaking world, my book was available only upon request and in bookstores, and then it was kept under the counter. And what happened over time is that it was declared actually on French television at one point to be a dangerous book. The important thing is that for those of us who don't want to self-identify as gay, whose same-sex attractions are unwanted, we now have to fight for our right to seek out this kind of help. For example, recently, uh, Julia Ward at Eastern Michigan University was um, removed from the graduate program when um, she, as a Christian, said that in good conscience, she uh, could not give counseling to a gay couple. She talked to her supervisor in her program, and the supervisor said, well, just assign them another uh, counselor in training. And so that's what happened. And unless she signs on the dotted line of a particular ideology regarding same-sex attraction, she can't get her education. Legal experts agree that religious freedom and same-sex marriage cannot coexist. One big problem with same-sex marriage is that it reinforces false assumptions that are all over the internet and in the media. How many times have you read or heard that change is not possible for homosexuals? In fact, those same people will say that change is even harmful and should not be attempted. I always just assumed I must have been born this way because I, I felt pretty at home in my relationships with women. And so I just made a conclusion that, that this must be who I am and I'm born this way. While the general public seems to believe that people are born gay and can't change, that has not been the conclusion of researchers. There are so many people who find themselves with homosexual attractions and don't want to be homosexual. They don't want to identify as gay. They want another option for their lives. People t tell me all the time that you cannot change. But effectively what they're telling me is what my story is and I'm telling you that I've changed. Change is very real in my life. I'm not the person I was seven years ago. I'm no longer Frank the gay guy. I'm just Frank. And there's freedom in that, in knowing that it's not all tied up in that, in homosexuality. I have been dealing with same-sex attraction since I was a boy. I remember it back as early as seven or eight years old. My wife Lorraine and I have been married just about 27 years and there have been difficult times. It's not been an easy marriage and much of that struggle has related to the inner turmoil that I deal with in walking out same-sex attraction. I uh, chose to stay married to Jerry even though he was struggling with same-sex attraction because I believe God chose us to be married. I believe that there's a God that created me and designed me and, and his plan is the one that's going to work best for me. He calls us to be together as man and woman as long as we should live. I'm happy that I've stayed with that choice because life has gotten um, better and better actually. 
We're in a great stage in our relationship right now. Well, there's a lot of debate regarding the issue of whether change is possible, that someone can uh, authentically change their sexual orientation. Exodus definitely believes that orientation can change. It's representative in thousands of men's and women's lives that have made a shift in their orientation. I would be an example of that. Someone who was exclusively uh, same-sex attracted uh, for most of his life and experienced a significant shift in orientation to the point to where I can be happily married uh, to my wife and to have a fulfilling and uh, deep marriage. This is a deeply personal subject to me because I not only work with men who are in conflict over their homosexuality, I have been a man in conflict with his homosexuality and know very well what it's like to reach a point of saying, Lord, I have this condition, I did not ask for it, but I don't know what to do about it. Where do I go from here? My name is Joanne Hiley, and I definitely had problems with lesbianism for 10 years of my life, ages 13 to 23. And I did have complete freedom from homosexuality. I had no desire for any woman. I was crazy about my husband. Uh, over the 33 years that I've been counseling people, uh, I've actually counseled one-to-one -one around 1,500 people. I just rejoice in God and in His power to set people free from homosexuality. So, you know, they, they can say all they want to about how no one can change, but they can't, they can't fool me. I see it and I work with it and it's, it's real. And really, when I, when I received the piece of paper from the health department that said, you know, that I had contracted HIV, you know, it was, it was right there. It was a death sentence. There are many people who claim that it's harmful for a therapist to try to help someone change in their sexual orientation. And so when clients come in saying, I have these attractions, these homosexual attractions, and I don't want to be gay, there are many people that, that say therapists should not assist those clients in achieving their goals for their lives because it's harmful. Yet the research reveals that it is not harmful. There have never been research studies that have concluded that therapeutic attempts to change sexual orientation are harmful. In fact, it's, it's unethical not to assist a client in seeking to accomplish their goals for their lives, including their goals of living a life beyond their homosexual attractions. One last problem we see with same-sex marriage is simply a question. Is it really marriage? Well, be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. In Christianity, we could never uh, say that there is such a, a thing as same-sex marriage because we only have one definition of marriage, and that's between a man and a woman. From the word go, uh, human sexuality is meant to be diversity in service to unity. The two become one. So same-sex marriage is um, uh, a contradiction in terms because marriage, according to the Judeo-Christian understanding, is two people who are other coming together into a union and their very otherness causes a bond to happen. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony. Any form of sexual expression apart from a monogamous heterosexual marital union falls short of our Creator's intentions. And because it falls short of His intentions, we reject it as being both sinful and unhealthy. Sex, according to God, is becoming one flesh. And if you become one flesh as God intends, the sex organs of the same sex will not become one flesh. There is no way. Duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the increase of mankind, according to the will of God. 
and that children might be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. The primary purpose of marriage is still, no matter how many times they want to uh, deny it and curse it, the primary purpose of marriage is still the propagation, the procreation of the human race. In Psalm 11.3, it says, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? We've shown you many problems with same-sex marriage, but an even bigger problem is the state of the institution of marriage in America today. The statistical evidence is quite clear. Rampant divorce and fatherless homes are such serious problems that some may see the situation as hopeless and say that we should simply accept these trends along with same-sex marriage. The destruction of marriage has not been coming from homosexual people. It's been coming from men and women who give themselves permission to commit adultery, to use pornography, to neglect each other sexually and emotionally, and to, in essence, not take seriously the covenant they've entered into. Leave the whole gay couple issue aside. Nationally, we have a major crisis of male and female having the capacity to stay together. 55% of American kids have experienced their parents rejecting each other. American men and women began to become sexually dysfunctional back in the 50s and 60s. I think their parents started before that. That generation gave rise to the kids of the sexual revolution. The revolution had already started in the beds of their married parents and the destruction of society at its basic and most fundamental level started. God offers us a different path. Let's renew our personal commitment to our own marriage, making it everything God intended it to be. Letting your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What to do about all of this? Well, remember, we don't elect judges to the Supreme Court. We elect a president who nominates these justices, and we elect a Senate that confirms them. Then they serve for life. So who you choose as your senators and who you choose as your next president makes all the difference on these critical moral and social issues like life and marriage. 80% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. With the Supreme Court in mind, I encourage you to open your Bible and do what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're all commanded to pray for all of our leaders and those in authority so that we might lead peaceful and quiet lives. Pick a justice, pick one that you agree with and one that you don't, and pray for both of them on a regular basis. Thank you for watching this sobering presentation about the realities associated with same-sex marriage. For the Family Research Council here in Washington, D.C., I'm Tony Perkins.